The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Jesus' mission included, includes making the unclean clean again. A cleansed Samaritan leper becomes a model for those who would praise and worship God and give thanks for God's mercy. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through a region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean, but the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The Gospel of the Lord. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Oh God, we give you thanks that you have come a long, long way to be with us, to forgive us, to show us how to live, to die on the cross, as these children said, so that we can be with you forever and know that we're forgiven. Amen. A lot of you have grandmas and grandpas who live out of state. Can you raise your hand if that's the case? I just am always curious, yeah. And uh, at Christmas time, generally, if the, we if the roads aren't uh, bad, uh, they want to be with you, don't they? And they want to come from wherever they live. And when they come, quite often, if they're uh, driving a car, they load the back seat up with presents. Uh, if uh, there are little ones that they're coming to visit especially. Uh, well, that was the case with one family uh, who had their grandparents coming for Christmas from out of state. And as the grandparents rolled in and they went out to greet them, the little boy, the grandson, looked in the back seat, first of all, and saw a great big box there with his name on it. And he happily lugged that into the house, kind of shook it. In there, it was heavy. Put it under the tree and then waited a couple of days for Christmas Eve to come. And they went to worship to the candlelight service. They came back, had their meal, and then it was that magical time to see what was in the box. And he went first, and he ripped it open, and there was a train, a train for him. And he asked his dad and his grandpa, can you set this up right away, right now? I want that train set up. And he, they did. And his mother whispered into his ear and said, you know, isn't there something you want to tell your grandma and grandpa? And he thought, I forgot I forgot to say thank you. And he rushed over to them and yelled into their faces, thank you, and gave them a big hug and then went right back to his train to play some more with it. The parents would have liked to see a little more appreciation, but that's how little boys are, aren't they? Especially with trains. Does that story sound at all familiar to you in your life? We want the words thank you to come out out of our children and grandchildren or others, not out of a sense of duty or of a sense of that's the thing you should say, but rather out of a grateful heart. You know, every, uh, every May uh, we get some invitations, our family, to go to graduation parties for kids from this church typically, and we do that, and tuck a little gift into each card. And it's really interesting to see what happens next with the thank you notes. Who writes the best thank you notes? Young women or young men, would you think? The women do. The young girls do. I have some very beautiful thank you notes on my desk from these young uh, women. Who takes the longest time to write thank you notes, do you think? <laughs> the young girls or the young boys? The boys do. 
I heard a great tip, though, after the first service. Uh, one woman said, a grandma said, you know how you solve that? You take away all the money and all the gift cards that they get in those cards, and you put it in a safe place, and you say, you're not going to get that until you're done with your thank you notes. <laughs> and that solves the problem right away. Well, it brings us to our story today, which is about way more than thank you notes, but in a sense, it is about how do we say thanks. There's a lot of interesting little tidbits, if that's your thing, in this story about uh, Jesus and the lepers. There's some words on the screen that are more than what they appear. Uh, there's some hidden meanings, there's some clues, there's some code in these phrases, like on the way to Jerusalem, that's not just kind of the GPS of the story. It's saying he's on his way to the cross. That's what that means. Or the next one, going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. That's, again, not a GPS kind of tip. It's saying as he's heading to the cross, he's going to show you what the kingdom of God looks like. Or the next one, keeping their distance, they called out. Tammy referred to that with the kids that leprosy was a terrible disease and you had to keep literally 12 feet away was the law between you and a person without leprosy, unless you were with a bunch of other people who already had it because it was so contagious. And then the last word there, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. If you've ever been to a traditional worship service, uh, like at a 815 here or any place, they may sing a thing called the Kyrie. You ever heard those phrase, those words? Kyrie eleison, which literally means Lord have mercy. Or we change it up a little bit and we might say Christe eleison, which means Christ have mercy. Sing it all the time at the early service. It's an ancient song that starts in this story and other stories like it. They're not the only ones to cry out, Lord, have mercy, because desperate people get on their knees, either literally or figuratively, to pray that prayer, Lord, have mercy. As the old saying goes from World War II, there are no atheists in foxholes. You ever heard that one? Think about it a minute. Or what day had record attendance in America, not on Christmas Eve or on Easter, the day, the Sunday after 9-11? Because on 9-11, our prayer was, Lord, have mercy. What is happening? or go to any emergency room in any town and sit around there for a while and just wait for the latest car accident to come in or shooting and those anxious families, what are they doing as they sit in those chairs while their loved one is back in a room somewhere being worked on? They're praying the Kyrie, aren't they? Lord, have mercy. Now, we've been on the other side of this story, too, with the nine lepers, or even the ten, who are healed of their illness. You probably haven't had leprosy. I don't know anyone in my life who's ever had that. But you've been healed of other things, perhaps, or have had, had loved ones that were healed. Maybe suddenly through a surgery, maybe slowly, like through chemotherapy or some other kind of thing. We know how it feels to be well. And it's a great feeling, isn't it? But there's kind of a downside to it that you can forget who healed you or who made you well over time. Maybe not right away, but we tend to get a little forgetful when we're living well. Or as one author put it, the ultimate tragedy in this story is that the nine lepers get the healing, but not the healer. They miss out on the relationship. They experience a miracle, but not the miracle worker. They receive the gift, but didn't know and love the giver. 
You know, we're a lot like that little boy with his train. We can get so busy playing with the trains of our lives that we forget the one who has come a long, long way to be with us and to love us and to bring us gifts that you can't buy in any store. When we're busy being well, which all of us are, we can so easily become like these nine lepers and start to take it or take, uh, forget rather, the people in our lives that make our lives so rich and full. Let's look at this other one, though, the one leper, as Tammy said, and look at what happens to him and what's going on with him. Martin Luther was once asked to describe what true worship looks like. And you know, you would have thought, well, that'd be with a big, beautiful pipe organ or lots of singing or strong preaching. But look what he says true worship is. It's the tenth leper turning back. What does he mean by that? What does he mean by that? Well, look at the story again. And there on the upper left, you see some of the phrases that Luke uses to describe what he does. And aren't these worship words? Hmm? Think about it. He turns back. We have a word for that. I think it was in one of our songs today, or maybe our, our confession. We call that repentance. When you're walking this way and away from God and you turn around and go back this way, there's a word for that. We call it repentance coming home to God. Or he prays God with a loud voice. We've done that already through our singing. And by the way, isn't it true that we often forget or take advantage or take for granted that this band is going to show up every week and lead us in worship? Can we thank them for doing that and for how good they are? Hmm? Yeah. You know, we just take, take it, just assume they're going to be here and, and have practice and do the beautiful music that they provide us with. So he praised God. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet, presumably laid down at his feet, and, uh, and then thanked him over and over that you're...